retired, Mr. Deutsch. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director A, first, I want to thank you and all the men and women of the FBI uh, for what you do every day to keep us safe. I also want to extend my condolences, my sympathy to the families of Special Agent Alf and Special Agent Schwarzenberger, who were shot and killed while serving a warrant in Sunrise, Florida, just south of my district. Um, I also, uh, Director A, would like to just follow up on some of the things that, um, that you've touched on today. First of all, you said uh, just a, a little while ago that 9-11 was uh, why you returned to public service. And I, I just wanted just to follow up on that. The 9-11 the community, as you know, Director Ray, has asked the FBI to conduct a full and complete declassification review of all documents related to the September 11th attacks. It has been nearly 20 years now since that horrific day. And these families, the American people, I think, deserve this. And so I would just ask whether you will commit to conducting a full and complete declassification review. Uh, we are working very hard on trying to declassify as much information as we can and to share as much information as we can. Um, I understand why this is frustrating uh, to uh, any number of families. Um, and we will commit to continuing to try to provide as much information as we responsibly can. I, I would urge you to. I would urge you to, to pursue a full declassification review. Uh, I want to just follow up on on the responses on your responses, uh, both to Chairman uh, Nadler and to Mr. Cohen about the Norfolk memo. Um, you said that um, we tried to make sure the information got to the right people. You said you tried three ways. You emailed it to Capitol Police. Uh, you did a verbal briefing uh, in command post, including Capitol Police, and, uh, and that you used the law enforcement portal that all law enforcement partners have access to. You, you then went on to tell Mr. Cohen that the information arrived essentially, I think you said, the night or afternoon before January 6th, and it was promptly passed on, but it was raw, unverified, uh, we decided that even though it was raw and unverified, we needed to pass it on to all of our partners, um, which you did. You didn't explain, and I would ask you to explain, what happened next? Well, you passed it on, and what did you do to follow up with this really important information about what, what may take place the next day in the United States Capitol? Um. Well, I, I'm not sure that there's specific investigative activity that I could discuss. I think the, the point of passing this information on, we didn't know what to make of it, and that's why I emphasized that it was raw, unverified information uh, without a specific identity attached to it. But the judgment was made, which is not the way we prefer to have to do things, but given the, f the framing of the information, we decided out of an abundance of caution to pass it on to uh, and, I, and sometimes when there's a reference to the email, you know, it's important to understand we're talking about their chosen representatives on the Joint Terrorism Task Force, the whole right. purpose of which Director is to keep people in the loop. Yes. I, no, I, under, I understand. I, and I understand that's, the, that's their purpose. Um, you had a memo that said uh, that uh, the report that detailed online posts said that individuals in Washington were ready for war at the Capitol called for potential, it talked about potential for violence in Washington, D.C. in connection with plans stop the steel protest on January 6th. That's what was in the memo. I know you passed it on. What do you do once you passed it on? And I'm going to ask, I'm asking the question because we're not at the, at, we don't, we don't know what the answer is. We know that this was out there. We don't know whether you did anything other than pass it on through these channels. And it was damning enough information, certainly it seems in retrospect, that though raw, you would have then followed up to make sure that, that every step was followed once you passed on the information. So what happened after you passed it on? Well, I guess the way we look at it is we, we passed it on in not one, not two, but three different ways uh, in order to make sure that it got through to the people uh, who needed to have that information to exercise their responsibilities uh, to engage in the physical security, which is well, not not what we do. I, 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 I may be missing the point of your question. Not, I, I think so. I, Director Ray, respectfully, I think you are. When you say it's not your responsibility uh, to ensure physical security, you had this memo that 
foretold or at least suggested what might happen. And I'm going to finish with this, Director Ray. The reason this is so upsetting to me in particular is because it just reminds me too much of the two tips that the FBI got before the mass shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. One to someone in Mississippi who saw a troubling YouTube comment. The other, after receiving a 13 minute long voicemail with troubling details about the shooter, that was closed as having said there was no lead value. I understand you thought that there were, this was worth passing on, but it seems like there should have been more than simply saying, it was the night before, it came in late, we just passed it on through our channels. That's all our respect. The uh, really gentleman, to do. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. Christopher Ray was uh, fr flat out lying right there. And the, and the fact is, uh, he is an incompetent director. He was not qualified for this job. I think I'm you know, a huge Trump supporter, but I think it was one of the biggest mistakes uh, of the Trump presidency was putting Christopher Ray in there. And uh, I think he showed it, especially in this, his opening remarks that he made today, how biased he actually is. Because everything that he said, especially about extremist violence, was completely sided to the left. Everything that had to do with any type of group that calls themselves patriots or anything that happened on January 6th was noted and, and displayed by his language as something that is far extreme with very little, if any, people that were there that, to be peaceful. And he made it sound as though the left is mostly peaceful with just a few things. Everything that comes out of this guy's mouth is pushed to the left, but it's subtle. So if you've been you know, a prosecutor or a, a U.S. attorney, or if you've been in the FBI and you listen to his language, you can literally see this. And I, I, and I think some of these congressmen and congresswomen actually saw this today, and I think they went after him, but he's not going to bend as far as that goes. I will tell you that I have spoken directly to FBI agents that are investigating January 6th, you know, um, issues, and ranging from individuals that uh, were in the Capitol to individuals who were not in the Capitol. One, one thing that stands out, the, the, the most recent conversation I had with an FBI, FBI agent here in Salt Lake indicated he said he's never seen anything like this. They are given a mandate. They are to go out. They have been given the questions they're supposed to be asking. They have been given the way they're supposed to proceed on this case. They don't have individualized authority. It is all coming from Washington, D.C. I've spoken to prosecutors that are prosecuting these cases. And this is not individualized justice. They are lumping everybody into the same category, and they are treating them uh, like, un unlike I've ever seen in a case. Uh, the Department of Justice is supposed to address every single case, unless it's a conspiracy case, according to the criminal conduct of that individual. They're not doing that. None of the prosecutors mm. have authority. It's all coming straight from Washington, D.C., there is so much energy put towards these people, and there's not the same energy put towards Antifa. Why didn't he explain that? Why couldn't he explain that? Well, I don't think he could explain it because, again, he was making this into uh, more of a political uh, stand. And, you know, he, he said there were three categories of people on January 6th. He failed to completely mention the people who were literally invited into uh, the Capitol building by the, the Capitol Police. And the majority of the people that were there did nothing. It, he made it sound as though if you came on the Capitol grounds, you were an extremist. And that is just not the case. There were some violent people there. There were some people that went into the Capitol that did some very nefarious things. But his category, uh, the way he categorized these people was absolutely wrong. And the way that the FBI has systematically as uh, Brett just uh, pointed out there, been told how to investigate January 6th, they've systematically been kept from truly investigating or going after the leftists. And that is so clear because of the way that there's just nothing going down about these individuals on the left. And I'll, I'll just say one other thing. In all my time in the FBI, the only white supremacist case that I ever saw, and I was in New York the entire time, was prison-related. There was no white supremacy, uh, massive uh, agenda going on in the United States, and it's not happening now. And it's another example of how they use these things and push them out in the media.
When you think about what Antifa did last summer, the number of federal properties that they destroyed um, or defaced, and the money that they caused to small businesses, the, the, the police officers who they injured, the Secret Service members, they really haven't been held accountable to the same type of behavior that they did all last summer. Why not? They have not been. I mean, you think about what domestic terrorism is. When you burn down a police station and you take over city blocks, that's domestic terrorism. And they have not been held accountable. Uh, I'm ashamed to, to say that, you know, my, my former office, you know, the Department of Justice, I, I wish I could see courage. I wish I, I could see U.S. attorneys standing up. You know, it's interesting. I, I represent an individual who... Um, went into the Capitol, um, was told she could go in, and was actually pointed by a security guard to the direction she should go. And she's being prosecuted. She's being charged with uh, misdemeanors. She, she has no criminal history. She thought the only other Capitol she's ever been in is a state Capitol that's open 24-7. She thought you could walk in. She, so there's a, there's a wide disparity a, a, between, you know, who Chris Ray is identifying and they want to prosecute every single person that was there to send a message. And that's what this is. It's message prosecuting. And, and, and that's mm -hmm. never a, a, an appropriate decision by a prosecutor.